notes and quotes from Michigan, Texas, Florida State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and more from across college football after the stinger. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of Good Morning College Football. I am Nicholas Ian Allen of CFB Winning Edge and Campus to Canton. Dot com. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, for joining us three days a week here on the uh, Good Morning College Football Show. If you're with us live, uh, if you are viewing it uh, on YouTube, perhaps uh, uh, later uh, than uh, <laughs> we broadcast each day, uh, we would very much appreciate you giving this video a like, uh, subscribing to the Campus to Canton YouTube channel. Uh, we very much appreciate your support, however you are able to give it. We've had a nice bump in signups at campusdecanton.com since we started Good Morning College Football. We're very thankful for that. Uh, we're also very thankful uh, for those of you who choose to become annual members at the site. You can join for as little as $2.99 per month. Uh, we've got a wide range of content available at that level, written content, access to uh, the Discord, uh, tons of tools, stats, analytics, all kinds of great stuff. Uh, but we've got uh, even more the higher up you go uh, in those tiers, including the C2C Winning Edge and all 22 tier packages, which include a lot of the work that I do at uh, CFB Winning Edge and Campus to Canton. Uh, that includes our 2024 returning production database, which uh, is live and available to all of those all 22 and C2C Winning Edge members. That includes individual team pages on all 134 FBS teams. And the next big project, we're a little over a month month away from our target date to publish our 2024 team profile. So uh, projected depth charts, projected point spreads, uh, all kinds of information uh, for all 134 FBS teams. We are uh, throwing Delaware in there a year early. Uh, plus more, we always try to pack that uh, with as much information as possible. And uh, again, our target date for uh, making that available to our uh, members in those uh, top two tiers is uh, uh May 1st. So uh, looking forward to that. But however you choose to support us, we very, very much appreciate it. And of course, uh, we very much appreciate the work that uh, beat reporters are out there doing uh, work you know, on the ground attending practice when they can, when they're not able to attend practice, uh, you know, because of course some teams have uh, more limited availability than others. Uh, there's a wide range of reporters, and team sites, and uh, people who are, are close to these programs who uh, still work tire tirelessly to find information uh, and put that out to uh, folks like us who are very, very interested in it. So uh, we certainly could not do this show three days a week uh, without the hard work of a, a wide range of you know, newspaper reporters, team site uh, folks, um, just just lots of great college football uh, people out there who are, are doing the work and, and putting that uh, information out there for us to consume. And, and uh, we try to collect it. We try to give credit where credit is due as well. And on that note, uh, at Michigan, Anthony Broom of the Wolverine, the on three site that covers uh, Michigan, uh, there were some interesting quotes about the, the quarterback battle coming from star tight end Colson Loveland. Uh, one of my personal favorites, certainly at the tight end position, but I think a, a pretty uh, just fun player to watch in general. think that he has a, a really, really bright future. But um, Broom passed along some quotes from Loveland and, and of course a, a topic of conversation anytime it, it comes up at Michigan is you know who is going to be the starting quarterback for the defending national champions there's been plenty of speculation uh that perhaps Michigan's you know 2024 starting quarterback isn't actually on campus in Ann Arbor right now I I certainly don't know that but um uh, Broom was among the reporters who asked Loveland about um, you know, how what he has seen from the early days of spring practice. There's a long list of Michigan quarterbacks who are going to be competing for that spot. And uh, one item of note that Broom mentioned, uh, Jack Tuttle, the most experienced quarterback 
in that group uh, has been limited so far in spring ball. But uh, Loveland has liked what he's seen from the group so far. Quoting here, uh, according to Broom's reporting, Loveland said, uh, they each have an individual skill set that they excel at. Uh, Orgy, he's got it on his feet too. He's good with his legs. Uh, Jaden Denigal throws a good ball. Davis Warren throws a good ball. It's been an open competition thus far, and it's been cool to see those guys battle it out. But still a lot of spring ball left and a lot to go. They've all been handling it really well, staying on the grind and just trying to get better every day. It's a great point finding that chemistry between the competition. So this is a, a later question talking about, you know, the receiving core and, and Loveland being a, 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 you know, productive receiver at the tight end position. How do you develop that uh, level of chemistry that you need ahead of the season when there are, you know, four guys uh, rotating in and getting those first team reps. So this is uh, what Loveland had to say on that note. It's a great point finding the chemistry between the competition, but first it starts with the competition. It has started out great. Everyone's got a fair opportunity to win the job. We've got time. It's spring ball. Uh, we have all summer to get it right too, but hopefully we just find that out. I don't think anyone here is worried about who the starting quarterback is and who's going to take charge. It has to play its course out at this point. Uh, the offense can be based around skill sets the quarterback has. I can't que uh, answer that question now. Uh, talking about you know what the, what the offense is going to look like as a whole, uh, we'll see when it comes to the starting quarterback. So, uh, quarterback is a position that, of course, obviously uh, carries a, a huge amount of weight. Uh, in the way that we project things, CFB winning edge. And I've mentioned our, you know, early uh, power rankings, how those are uh, shaping up as we do that work on our team profiles. And Michigan is a team that right now is on the outside of the top 10 looking in. That's something we're not used to seeing for a de uh, defending national champion. Part of that is, uh, you know, even though it's not the, the biggest uh, factor in our calculations, but moving from, Jim Harbaugh, who ranked quite highly in our head coach ratings, to Sharon Moore, who despite you know a game here or there, uh, really is is um, inexperienced as a head coach. So we do put you know a default rating in for a first time uh, head coach. So there's a, a bit of a drop off there. That is a factor, but also the quarterback position. Alex Orgy is right now penciled in as our starter. Uh, he is uh, the way we calculate those individual player ratings just because he hasn't played very much, wasn't uh, you know, an elite rated recruit coming in. Uh, he's, he's basically below FBS average in our individual player ratings. Now, I mean, he was on Bruce Feldman's freaks list. We've heard quotes, we've passed along quotes from uh, the Rose Bowl preparations for Michigan, where Alex Orgy was, you know, compared to Jalen Milrow at Alabama, who is uh, having a spectacular spring and, and uh, you know, was one of the best quarterbacks in college football last year uh, by, you know, once all was said and done. So uh, it's very, very possible that we are underrating Michigan as a whole. It's very possible we're underrating Alex Orgy. It's possible right now we have the wrong guy penciled in. Jack Tuttle is slightly higher rated, was a little bit higher rated recruit coming in, uh, was also, uh, you know, is more experienced. He's entering his seventh season, so he gets the full experience uh, adjustment in our calculations, whereas Orgy's a third-year sophomore. Um, so, you know, he, he just gets a little lower of that uh uh, part of the calculation. And, and so uh, it's possible, again, you know, the quarterback position, which weighs very, very heavily in our roster strength ratings, and you add those up to our team strength ratings, uh, maybe we're a little too low on Michigan. I, I have confidence that it'll work itself out, much like Loveland and whoever steps in, probably going to hand the football off a lot to, you know, Donovan Edwards and uh, Khalil Mullings, uh, dump it off to Loveland. But um, as of right now, just the way we calculate it, it it's a question mark. And uh, is Michigan a team that's going to be active in the spring transfer portal? Hard to say. Um, but uh, there, there are folks out there. You hear some whispers that uh, perhaps they will be. So uh, just just something to, to keep in mind there as we try to learn a little bit more about you know, this position battle specifically, but also at a place like Michigan, where it is a little bit more difficult to, to you know, get those extended viewing windows for uh, spring practice. Uh, at Texas, 
there's there's sort of an ebb and flow of information at Texas uh, as well. But Eric Nolan of Inside Texas uh, had a uh, write up uh, earlier this week where he mentioned a couple of players whose stock has been on the rise this spring. Also gave us a little bit of a breakdown of uh, some of the position battles and, and how things are stacking up as well. The first uh, name that that caught my eye, and we've mentioned him before, true freshman Ryan Wingo. Uh, really exciting skill set. Uh, Nalen says all the caveats apply to Steve Sarkeesian's very limited wide receiver snaps, where you know last year there was a, a pretty tight-knit uh, core of wide receivers who were really, really leaned on heavily uh, for those opportunities. And, and uh, so, you know, even though there's a lot of talent at that position for Texas, the way things have worked there uh, recently under Sark, um, you know, you really have to seemingly break into, you know, one of those top four roles, basically, uh, to, to step up and, and be in line for any major, uh, you know, level of, of production. Will Wingo break into that group? Uh, seems like perhaps there's a little bit of uh, not necessarily conflicting information, but maybe, you know, multiple viewpoints from from different writers, different sites, different sources. Uh, so we'll see how it all plans out. But according to Nalen, uh, reading here from the piece, he says, the stud freshman is announcing himself in a major way. This shouldn't be a surprise, but the big receiver moves incredibly well and is giving good cornerbacks trouble early on. Uh, Nalen also mentioned Trey Moore, who is uh, highly, highly rated in our individual player ratings, despite not being uh, a rated at all as a high school recruit when he uh, ended up at UTSA. Of course, had a huge uh, retro freshman season, freshman All-American a couple of years ago there, just has put up incredible numbers as a pass rusher, um, a playmaker on the edge. According to Nalen, Trey Moore is showing he clearly belongs at a high-level P4 program and says, no wonder Nick Saban wanted him. So Saban, uh, before retiring at Alabama, uh, was in pursuit of, of Trey Moore. And, and so uh, we'll have some quotes later from Sark about Moore, but he's a player that um, has just been an incredibly, incredibly productive and was a big pickup for Texas uh, through the transfer portal. Nalen also notes uh, some players at the offensive skill positions at running back, Trey Wisner. Somebody I've, I've seen the name pop up in reports really over the last couple of weeks. And of course, you know, CJ Baxter uh, and, and Jaden Blue are seemingly uh, 1A and, and 1B at Texas and and are one of those elite running back duos we expect. Uh, but Wisner is somebody that's that's consistently getting uh, good reports coming out of spring camp. Also, Savion Red uh, says uh, uh, that he can play, and the two uh, true freshmen are already showing some promise. So running back, very, very deep position there for the Longhorns. At wide receiver, Nalen says that Isaiah Bond has been a star. Jonte Cook has not been far behind. DeAndre Moore is the real deal. Matthew Golden has been limited, but that's allowed Ryan Wingo to do what he does. And then, of course, uh, one of the other transfers coming in from Oregon State, Silas Bolden, uh, is on the way. So uh, just a, a, an embarrassment of riches at both the running back and wide receiver positions for, for Texas, it seems. Uh, at tight end, Nalen says, you know, not as much depth, but Juan Davis is having a good camp and uh, we've mentioned the name Jordan Washington uh, uh, multiple times already. True freshman says he can play this year. Chip Brown of Horns 247 uh, passed along some notes as well as a few quotes from quarterback Quinn Ewers. Uh, he not necessarily this is the you know not conflicting information, but uh, just some you know some different names mentioned first. A little bit different tone maybe around some of the receiver uh, conversation. But according to Brown, uh, who mentioned that Bolden. Won't arrive until June, but Bond, Cook, Golden, Moore, and Butler are probably off to the best starts through five at spring practices, so didn't mention Wingo. Um, uh, one source, according to Brown, says uh, that the team speed on offense as a whole is uh, higher even than last year when Texas was a uh, college football playoff participant, so that is good news. Uh, he says that, uh, of course, 
there is a, a lot of athleticism for Wingo, uh, but uh, this this source, according to Brown, noted that you know Wingo, uh, at least at one point, uh, was was receiving um, uh, sort of some uh, you know hard coaching in Wednesday's practice uh, due to uh, you know just just running a route, not not doing it quite as uh, as the coaches would hope, and and not a surprise that that freshmen uh, certainly have things to work on, but um, it, it's interesting just to, to hear different uh, examples and, and different observations where, you know, one guy flashes just huge athletic ability as a true freshman and it's so exciting, but then another take on it or, or you know, just a little bit more uh, information shows that, yeah, you know, even though maybe he has uh, a, a, an incredibly bright future and high ceiling still, you know, perhaps uh, a little ways to go as far as uh, details and, and things like that, but um, far more positive uh, about Wingo than negative, but will he be able to break into that uh, experienced group? Um, and, you know, will it be the same sort of situation as it was last year for Texas, where it was kind of those, you know, top few guys at the top of the depth chart uh, who got the the vast, vast majority of the work. So interesting to see how it shakes out. But one player who uh, Quinn Ewers thinks is going to be a major target, and his opinion perhaps uh, matters uh, just as much as, uh, if, not any, if not more, uh, than almost anybody else. Um, Quinn Ewers here, according to Chip Brown, uh, said, quote, I think DeAndre Moore is going to be a heck of a ball player here. Super excited to work with him. He's a good buddy of mine. Also, we've been working on the chemistry and it's starting to click out there. Um, so Quinn Ewers also, uh, spoke about how, uh, he, uh, has uh, more he both he and more have the ability to lead uh saying more specifically uh quote definitely got the the capability to take over that receiving room for sure uh but then also talking about his leadership you were said uh quote i'm definitely having to step up in that role i'm super comfortable with it it's year three for me. Everybody expects it from me. I expect it from myself. Wouldn't rather be in any other position than what I am right now. Yours was also complimentary of Arch Manning, who it sounds like is having uh, a huge spring. Very, very impressive, according to a lot of reports from from several different sites. Um, Ewers apparently has uh, put on some weight. He was listed last year at 195 pounds. Uh, he says, according to Chip Brown, now he's up to 205. Um, and uh, quoting here said, I think I was just a few pounds too light last year, probably played every game around 200. So I'm around 205, trying to get up to 210 right now. Uh, it's got to be good weight. It can't be that mullet weight I had back when I weighed 220. Uh, uh, final note here on Texas. Uh, this is from Steve Sarkeesian, passed along again by Chip Brown of Horns 247. Uh, Trey Moore brings it, uh, according to Sarkeesian. Uh, that guy is wired right. What I like about Trey, first of all, is his work ethic. You can tell a guy uh, comes into the program and has a chip on his shoulder. Trey has got something to prove, and I think there's some value to that. So, um, uh, Trey Moore perhaps might have, you know, maybe not a household name across college football. Um, we don't spend as much time here because, of course, uh, Campus to Canton is a uh, fantasy uh, site first and foremost. So, we're mostly, uh, you know, worried about uh, offensive players, offensive skill positions, and things like that. But, of course, IDP, certainly a thing. Trey Moore putting up big uh, points in, in that form of the game. But just as far as his ability to impact uh, a team on the field at a, you know, position uh, of need uh, for Texas, that defensive line, there's a lot of uh, turnover, certainly a lot of talent. Uh, and, you know, both starting edge defenders from last year's team, Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke, are back. But when you had an opportunity to get a player like Trey Moore, who, um, uh, if you're familiar with how our, our individual player ratings work, um, uh, they're like, uh, you know, NCAA or Madden video game ratings. Uh, we do, uh, we made the, the decision 
this time last year to not cap our ratings at 99 or 100. Uh, so Trey Moore has actually broken that 100 uh, thresh mark, uh, which is pretty impressive for a guy who came in as an unrated recruit. Uh, but he has put up uh, 33 production points in his career, generally on the defensive side of the ball. We give a production point for every 50 tackles, two sacks, 10 pressures, four tackles for loss, two picks, four pass breakups, two f uh, force fumbles, things like that. So it can be difficult to accumulate uh, those types of points. And, and Trey Moore has just been among the very best in college football uh, at, at his position. Just the level of production is incredible. So um, excited to see what he can do, taking a step up in his level of competition. Sounds like He's uh, really been making life difficult uh, for the Texas offensive line, especially the competition that's ongoing uh, at the right tackle position, that one spot where uh, there is uh, an opportunity for somebody new to, to claim a full-time starting job. So uh, good news out of Texas that, that a lot of players, it sounds like, are, are really, really impressing for a team that we definitely expect to uh, be – very, very competitive. They're number four right now uh, in our CFP Winning Edge Team Strength Power Rankings. At Florida State on Thursday night, there were uh, uh, reports and quotes from Mike Norvell, who met with reporters after uh, a scrimmage, the first spring scrimmage in Tallahassee at Doak Campbell Stadium for the Seminoles this spring. Norvell said, uh, this is according to Chris Knee of Knowles 247, quote, I thought there were really good plays. I thought the defense was really good for a majority of the scrimmage. I thought that there was some speed and physicality that definitely showed up, some powerful plays. We created a couple of fumbles. We were able to see the talent and ability that I believe we have on that side of the ball. We spent a little time talking about the Florida State defense on Wednesday show and how you know, perhaps the numbers I threw out Monday when we were talking power rankings was a little low on, on that unit. Um, and I think that's that's true. Sounds like you know, the defense right now ahead of the offense, at least in this scrimmage. Um, but according to Norvell, quoting here again, I think the offense did a good job of responding. We've had some missed opportunities, some throws that we definitely would like to have back. But also there were some missed opportunities where we had a chance to finish a play and didn't there were some express, uh, explosive moments. And then we're always on the lookout who's the first player mentioned. Malik Benson had a touchdown. This is, again, quoting Norvell. Uh, Cam Davis got a touchdown, freshman running back. Uh, there were some guys that definitely showed up and had some explosive plays. I like what I'm seeing. I thought the newcomers did a good job. Landon Thomas showed up, did some really good things. Jalen Lucas got into space a couple of times. Really just obviously a good overall work day for our guys and what we needed to do for scrimmage one. So uh, Malik Benson consistently every time I read something about Florida State, sounds like he's the first wide receiver mentioned. Seems like he is a heavy favorite to be the top target for who we expect uh, the starting quarterback will be, DJ Uyunglele, the transfer most recently at Oregon State. And on that note, Norvell was asked, uh, you know, about the quarterbacks, about DJ Uyunglele, his experience, how that played into the scrimmage. Uh, quoting here, Brock does have a year within the system. So uh, Brock Glenn, the uh, quarterback who, who got a little playing time at the end of last year when uh, when uh, uh, Jordan Travis went down. Um, but I would say right now, quoting here, I would say right now that Brock has probably a little bit more confidence in some of the things that he's being asked to do. Uh, we've thrown a lot into the installations in the first four days. I think DJ has done really well in grasping things and really well in his overall understanding, but now it's just competition. He needed a day like today, and there were some really good moments and some plays where he kind of resorted back to maybe not the cleanest things when it comes to his fundamentals. But that is what today is all about. So, you know, hard to tell exactly uh, where things are going, but in that first quote, talking about how well the defense did, that's not necessarily uh, an indication that the quarterbacks were, uh, you know, at their sharpest. Um, I mentioned a few throws you might want to have back. One of the things, of course, that we saw uh, when DJ Uyunglele struggled a bit at Clemson was a lack of accuracy. Uh, so not sure exactly who he's alluding to there, but uh, Mike Norvell 
seemingly, uh, you know, not not ready just to hand it over uh, to DJU and, and mentioned that Brock Glenn, it sounds like right now, has a, a little bit firmer grasp on the offense as a whole. Uh, I'm not expecting that, that Glenn will end up winning this job, but, you know, you, you never know, and it is. Uh, there's a long way to go certainly a long way to go for, for DJU to get more comfortable, uh, both uh, physically and, and also just within the offense. But um, he's going up against a, a really, really talented defense, and, and that defensive line is very deep. Norvell mentioned uh, several players who were, uh, you know, giving the quarterbacks uh, a, a tough time, giving the, the offense a tough time. Uh, he said, quote, Pat had an early sack. You saw Daryl Johnson definitely flash. Saw Marvin Jones Jr., Sion uh, Loloe, uh, Timo, uh, Tommy, excuse me, uh, Tomiwa Durajei, and my apologies if I'm butchering uh, any pronunciations there, but uh, incoming defensive linemen, you know, there's a lot of turnover uh, there for Florida State this year, edge defenders. Um but I was reminded the other day, you know, talking about Florida State defense, that Daryl Jackson, the interior defensive lineman, could have, you know, potentially started for FSU last year had he uh, not been uh, ineligible after transferring from Miami. But, you know, Patrick Payton, uh, highly productive, talked about production points and, and individual player ratings. He's knocking on the door of a 100 after putting up 14 production points last year. Um, it's just a, a, a talented group, and they've added to it through uh, the transfer portal. Uh, Duro J is, is uh, an incoming transfer from West Virginia. I've heard plenty of positive reports about him, Marvin Jones Jr., the son of Marvin Jones, who is uh, an incredible player at Florida State, recently uh, transferring in from Georgia, where he started his collegiate career, making the transition to defensive end after being uh, an outside linebacker at, at Georgia. Uh, so uh, certainly, you know, some players coming in and, and uh, making an impact, it sounds like, but also uh, seeing how that group just sort of works itself out depth chart wise and and you know florida state one of those places you would you would imagine where when they've got a lot of uh guys they can lean on they can rotate that group uh throughout and and uh keep it fresh for um you know an entire game and 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 make life very difficult not only for uh their teammates on the other side but once once uh, the games get started uh make it difficult for acc opponents as well to the SEC, uh, a few observations at Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Uh, Mason Young and Eric Bailey of the Tulsa World were on hand for Oklahoma practice earlier this week, gave a rundown of 10 observations uh, from that viewing period, uh, made note of the quarterback running back pairings during an early option drill, uh, and Jackson Arnold, the Expected starter at quarterback uh, was working with Gavin Sawchuk, who seems to be in line for uh, top uh, ball carrying duties. Uh, General Booty, the number two quarterback, was with Javante Barnes. Uh, freshman Michael Hawkins was with Caleb Hicks. And freshman Brandon Zerberg was paired with Amika Megwa. So if we're trying to you know, read into that, uh, does that mean that the running back pecking order is Sawchuk, Barnes, Hawkins, Hicks, Megwa? Or excuse me, not, not Hawkins, of course. Uh, Hicks and Megwa. Uh, we shall see. The tight ends, we've mentioned uh, Bauer Sharp multiple times so far uh, this offseason. Arnold uh, threw seam routes and out routes to Bauer Sharp, according to Young and Bailey. Uh, Booty worked with Josh Fanuel. Hawkins aimed passes to Devon Mitchell. Zerberg and Cade McIntyre were paired. And uh, Thompson matched up with Hampton Fry. Uh, so uh, we did note earlier in the week that uh, Jake Roberts, the transfer from North Texas, who maybe is the top uh, competition for Sharp at uh, starting tight end. We expect they're both going to get uh, a decent amount of rap reps um, uh, this fall, uh, has been limited and, and did not participate in, in this particular drill. As for wide receivers in a 7-7 seven seven drill, Deion Burks, the Purdue transfer, uh, was impressive said he lined up against Robert Spears Jennings while Jalil Farouk and Woody Washington competed against one another. Uh, Jaquiz Petaway is a wide receiver who it sounds like is getting some positive buzz this spring, uh, said that uh, he made a contested catch 
between Spears Jennings and Washington, um, but a couple of receivers who did not participate uh, were Nick Anderson and Gavin Freeman, both of whom expect to uh, be contributors, potentially in Anderson's case, certainly starters. Uh, and toward the very end, you know, how is that top three wide receiver group uh, rotating uh, during the, the uh, end of the open viewing portion of practice, Jackson Arnold worked with the first team skill player set consisting of Jaleel Farouk, Deion Burks, and Jaden Gibson at receiver with Gavin Sawchuk at running back and Bauer Sharp at tight end. Javante Barnes was the second running back in with that group. So again, the Tulsa world there uh, giving us uh, sort of a blow by blow as best they can on, on who's getting those first team reps at Oakland. Oklahoma. For South Carolina, Wes Mitchell of Gamecock Central uh, gave some similar insight, but really focused on uh, three reps of 11 on 11 work in recent practice. So, you know, generally it's it's one of those situations where when you do this sort of fast pace 11 on 11, uh, it's kind of good versus good, ones versus ones, first offense versus first defense, twos versus twos, that sort of thing. As always, and, and Mitchell mentioned it, you know, keep in mind there are always guys missing from certain drills, but to the best of their ability, uh, this was how those those three particular reps uh, stacked up. And, and the first team offense for South Carolina, the quarterback, uh, most notably Lenore Sellers, Richard Freshman, who uh, is a campus to Canton favorite, certainly, uh, but also in very limited duty last year was really, really impressive. Uh, the running back getting reps, and we mentioned on Wednesday how that running back group at South Carolina has been impacted by injury so far this year. But Asker Attaway the third, the transfer from North Texas, got those first team reps at wide receiver. It was Gage Laverdane, the transfer from Miami of Ohio. Uh, Jared Brown, transfer from Coastal Carolina. And Mazio Bennett. Uh, the tight end was Josh Simon. The second team, and this kind of surprised me a little bit, Luke Doty, who it sounded like to me had been repping most of the spring at wide receiver, though also doing some quarterback work and uh, I'm sure a lot of things behind the scenes as well, meetings and things like that. He took the second quarterback group. Uh, Jawarn Howell, the transfer from South Carolina State, was the number two running back. The wide receivers were Peyton Mangrum, Elijah Caldwell, and Debron Gatling. Uh, and according to Mitchell, the third rep was uh, mostly number one players again, but kind of rotating the groups through. The, uh, was the third quarterback, Davis Bevel, got that rap. Attaway was back at running back. Then it was Laverdane, Amari Huggins-Bruce, the transfer from South Carolina, and Tyshawn Russell at wide receiver. Uh, Mitchell did note, you know, only seen glimpses of practice so far, but what they've seen uh, and what they've been told the veteran defense of South Carolina is pretty far ahead of the new look offense. So just file that away. Not uncommon in spring practice, but uh, you know, more experience on the defensive side of the ball makes some sense, certainly. Uh, at Tennessee, we uh, want to follow up something we mentioned briefly that uh, happened or, or were made aware of right before we went live on Wednesday. Uh, but Sophomore running back Cameron Selden is uh, set to miss some time this offseason. Recently underwent uh, surgery for a shoulder injury, according to Patrick Brown of Go Balls 247. Uh, Josh Heupel uh, gave some updates following the conclusion of a scrimmage on Wednesday. Um, uh, said, quote, with Cam, unfortunate, just early part of spring ball, had an injury to his shoulder, had surgery on it. We'll kind of evaluate where we're at in the backfield as uh, the rehab process gets started and base our decisions off of that and kind of where we project uh, where he's going to be. So running back already a little bit of a, a thin position group with uh, multiple uh, impact players moving on to the NFL, uh, Jalen Wright, Jabari Small, both uh, leaving Knoxville this year. So uh, Dylan Sampson, pretty clearly expected to be the, the top running back in 2024, but Cam Seldon uh, was expected to take a, a big step forward. So um, hopefully he'll be able to, to get back and, and uh, be fully healthy again soon. Um, but uh, an injury, you know, you never want to see uh, somebody go down in spring. Hopefully it's not something that's going to linger into the fall, but um, if so, you know, Tennessee, that's, that's pretty 
thin at the running back position uh, behind Samson and Selden. Uh, it sounds like sophomore Khalifa Keith and freshman Peyton Lewis, uh, plus uh, Deshaun Bishop, uh, who is a walk-on, but uh, according to uh, Brown, should be sort of uh, considered a, a walk-on in name only, um, are you know the, the players behind who have basically zero or very, very little game experience uh, so far. So will Tennessee be one of those teams that's in the, in the market for an incoming uh, transfer running back? There was a big name that hit, hit the market uh, earlier this week uh, who potentially – could be a fit, and we'll have more on on him uh, in uh, just a little bit. But uh, moving on now, a few more quotes. This one, uh, McLean Baxley, who covers Oklahoma State for uh, Go Pokes two four seven, uh, pass along some quotes from uh, an early uh, you know, prior to spring practice kicking off press conference with uh, Coach Gundy there in Oklahoma State. Uh, one thing that that caught my eye, and and uh, Baxley tweeted this one out uh, on Thursday, uh, was talking about you know the level of production and, and number of players basically returning for. Oklahoma State in 2024. And uh, Oklahoma State is a, a team that ranks incredibly high in our returning production database. Uh, they are number two right now in college football at the FBS level in our adjusted overall returning production. Uh, they're number three on the offensive side of the ball, number eight defensively. They are top 10 in both categories uh, in just raw returning production. So who's coming back from last year's roster. They're fifth in raw offensive returning production, ninth in raw defensive returning production. Put that together, they're number three in raw returning production nationally. So one of the teams that, uh, you know, uh, all the, the research that Bill Connolly has done in the past on returning production, if you're in that elite, you know, top five percent, uh, the, num the, the expectations of you taking uh, your your win total in a positive direction the next season uh, are really really high. Oklahoma State, a team that went ten and four last year, seven and two in the Big Twelve, also in a position now in a new look Big Twelve where uh, you could argue that uh, you know the the top two certainly the the long standing recruiting giants in the Big 12, Texas and Oklahoma, moving on uh, create some space for a team like Oklahoma State to really step in and, and be a, uh, you know, uh, maybe the the next uh, giant in uh, the conference. And, and based on who's coming back, Oklahoma State in a really, really good position. Getting to those quotes, uh, Gundy said, according to Baxley, um, uh, it's different now than it has ever been. For the most part, you're rebuilding a team every year and maybe sometimes every semester. We've been fortunate guys wanted to come back. I felt like uh, we would have quite a few of them. It's not something we really pursue. They have to make that decision on their own, and they made that decision. Prior to us starting in January, 90% of them had committed to coming back through some sort of social media. It's hard to tell nowadays about the reason why young men come back or stay. I will say that traditionally the group of offensive linemen kind of do things together. We have a large number of those guys that are sixth and seventh year, and they all decided that they wanted to come back and be together. We mentioned Oklahoma State's in pretty uh, unique territory as, as far as returning production on the offensive line, just about everybody coming back. Uh, so finishing up here from Gundy said, some of them followed, and I think there can be a domino effect at the end of December and at the end of the spring portal based on whether that goes for you or against you. Uh, Gundy also, uh, you know, had some some uh, notes, some quotes on Ollie Gordon. Uh, said that uh, you know Ollie needs to practice harder than he did last year, and and you probably remember that Gordon got off to a little bit of a slow start before just absolutely exploding in the month of October and quickly emerging as 
arguably the uh, top running back in college football, certainly uh, one of those uh, elite performers. Uh, he's in line for another huge season, and you would expect we'll get off to a faster start this year, but uh, is going to continue to get uh, you know, tough coaching from Gundy, uh, who said, you know, quote, he's not a secret anymore. So he has to raise the bar. Um, Gundy also, uh, you know, gave a little insight on the receiver room, said uh, Stribling will get a lot of work this spring, uh, but we're not going to put a lot of pressure on his hand. Uh, we're talking about uh, Dijon's Stribling, who came in, started, uh, I believe, four games last year as a transfer from Washington State before going down and missing the rest of the year with that hand injury. Um, uh, says, quote, he'll get a lot of mental work, work his legs and run routes, but we're going to let him rest a little bit longer his hand. Uh, Presley, talking about Brendan Presley, doesn't need a lot of work. This time last year, Rashad Owens was a third-team guy, and now he's a returning guy that had, what, 70 catches? He'll get a little work. All the young guys, Tyke Andrews, Cameron Hurd, uh, they're going to get all the work in the spring. All right, moving on at Pitt, uh, Abby Schnabel of Pitts, of the uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette uh, was on hand for a recent scrimmage and, and spoke with uh, Pat Narduzzi among the reporters uh, about that scrimmage, another place where it sounds like the defense uh, is right now ahead of the offense. Quoting Narduzzi here, uh, it comes down to turnovers. If the offense didn't turn the ball over, you probably win the scrimmage. Even with the turnovers their offense did have, it wasn't a blowout. It should have been a blowout, to be honest with you. Uh, the offense wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, given that it's just uh, had just six days to adapt to new offensive coordinator Cade Bell's scheme, uh, which is, of course, much different, up-tempo. Uh, and it sounds like the you know young quarterbacks were were getting reps and and things were uh, moving fast there. Uh, Narduzzi said, uh, you know, with all four quarterbacks to to get out and go play more freely as they become more accustomed to the new offense. Uh, said last season it, it sometimes felt like the quarterbacks who played. Phil Dracovic, Yarnell, uh, Value, uh, Yarnell and Var Nate Varnell and, and uh, Yarnell, excuse me, and, and Christian Value are, are the top two quarterbacks returning this year, uh, would have ha uh, would have a predetermined person to throw to, which wouldn't work uh, this season. Quoting here again, I'm, uh, it's just knowing when to throw the ball at times. It's going out there, making a play with all of them, really just throw it to the right guy, take the completion. It's not like we're looking for deep posts every time, take what they're giving you defensively. So uh, still lots of, of work to be done at Pitt. It sounds like the, the passing attack is uh, going to be more of a focus this year. There were some uh, quotes later in the piece from Schnabel uh, talking to a couple of defenders who mentioned that they're throwing the ball around a lot. So Pitt's still working some things out, but uh, I think some some positive signs moving forward there offensively. Uh, at Maryland, Emmett Siegel of Testudo Times, the SB Nation site, uh, passed along some quotes from head coach Mike Loxley. And of course he was asked about the quarterback position. Loxley uh, didn't really want to give much information. Say, quote, nobody asked me again. I can't make it any clearer. I have no idea who my starting quarterback is, and I am looking forward to figuring it out. Tuesday before UConn, week one opponent, uh, you'll get an answer. Uh, I did say, quote, we're, in, uh, we're excited with the guys that we have in that room. We've recruited some really good guys. Uh, we've got a great opportunity to, you know, develop that room and see if we can continue to build on a foundation that Talia Tungavailoa uh, played a part in Lane. Uh, Billy Edwards and Cameron Edge are experienced returners. Edwards has, has gotten the most experience. Uh, he's been joined by MJ Morris, the transfer from NC State, uh, who uh, was able to uh, come in prior to the ball, uh, bowl game and participate some in that bowl prep. Uh, if I were to handicap the race, I would think that that Morris probably has a, a slight edge in the competition, but we, of course, will see how it all shakes out. Uh, a couple of other quick notes. Notre Dame wide receiver Micah Gilbert has been uh, a buzzy name this spring. Uh, there was a highlight video tweeted out by Notre Dame's uh, social media team where he was featured uh, at Washington. Running back Will Nixon has left the program. This 
planning to enter the transfer portal. Uh, he was a wide receiver at Nebraska, transferred to Washington, and is also a Texas native. So if you're trying to you know, find some clues there for geography, uh, not, not necessarily sure that uh, we're going to get any strong indications. Could he potentially uh, follow Kalen DeBoer to Alabama? That's just me speculating, but you know, Nixon's one of those players that uh, DeBoer and that coaching staff seem to really like, had a role, even though he wasn't a, a, a you know starter or, or super productive player, was somebody that always seemed to be getting positive uh, reports in, in practice, maybe did you know some of those little things that uh, any team, could use so uh, don't don't be shocked if he ends up at Alabama. But if he's looking for a place where he can uh, be a more you know prominent uh, focus uh, of the offense, maybe that won't be the spot uh, where he's headed. But curious to see wherever he does end up at Cincinnati. BearcatJournal.com uh, reported that Brady Drogish, the former four-star quarterback recruit, is moving to defense, playing linebacker there. So a couple of Cincinnati four-star quarterbacks in recent years changing positions. Uh, and at UMass, one of the now, you'd have to expect, top uh, players in the transfer portal uh, is Karon Lynch Adams, former Rutgers transfer, had over 1,100 yards on the ground and 12 touchdowns for the Minutemen last season. Uh, according to Pete Nakos of On3, uh, informed coaches that he plans to leave as a grad transfer. I was trying to update my own uh, CFF rankings this week. Uh, had uh, Lynch Adams penciled in as a top 50 running back. He was somebody I was pretty excited about, not only coming off a great year last year, but the schedule, especially early on, sets up quite well for UMass, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, you know, might Tennessee be a team? We already speculated on that. Uh, LSU, we've mentioned several times uh, this spring how thin uh, the Tigers are at running back. Uh, there have been plenty of reports that Miami is looking for running back depth. Um, Adams is an Ohio native, so would a place like Michigan State uh, be a uh, potential landing spot? Uh, CFF owners are, are crossing their fingers, hoping that he ends up in the MAC. Uh, but uh, my initial read on it was that you know perhaps Lynch Adams is, is looking for an opportunity to move back to uh, a Power Four conference program. We'll see certainly how it shakes out, but uh, will he end up being a depth piece at a, a contending team? Uh, what are his motivations there? Would that be better for his long-term uh, prospects than, you know, stepping in and, and becoming the guy at uh, a, a lower tier uh, program or, you know, G5 conference like the Mac potentially? Um, we'll see. Very, very, very interested to see where he ends up. All right, a few other G5 notes. We'll try to move through these quickly so that we can save some time to talk about UMass and where they go from here. But uh, at San Diego State, Kurt Kenny of the San Diego Union Tribune uh, noted from the weekend, previous weekend, uh, San Diego State had a closed scrimmage, uh, but head coach Sean Lewis provided an update to reporters on Tuesday following practice. Uh, San Diego State's offense, that Aztec fast offense, uh, is one that CFF players are, are definitely going to be focused on this year. How are things shaking out? Sounds like AJ Duffy is still taking first team reps at quarterback. Uh, but according to uh, Kenny Lewis said that he has not separated himself yet from the others competing at the position. True freshman Danny O'Neill is consistently uh, getting uh, number two reps. It sounds like Cal Crum and uh, Javance uh, Tupo Atta Johnson is also in the mix. Uh, the wide receivers of note, the uh, top group uh, at the viewing period of uh, Tuesday's practice, according to Kenny, were Lewis uh, Brown the fourth, the Colorado State transfer, uh, Ja'Shawn Polk, transfer from West Virginia and a former Kent State player for Lewis, and Nate Bennett, a transfer from Portland State, as well as tight end Jude Wolf, a transfer from USC. And in fact, uh, Kenny noted that of the 11 players on the first team offense, seven were first year transfers. Um, at running back, Keenan Christian right now seems like he has established himself as the top running back, not a first year transfer, but you'll remember started his career at USC. 
at Charlotte, Hunter Bailey of the Charlotte Observer uh, had a pre-spring practice interview, was, was part of a, a group, got some quotes from uh, head coach Biff Pogge, who said, quote, I learned so much last year, so much I didn't know. We're a much more disciplined team. We're a much closer team, and we're a better conditioned team. I really like it. Um, one major uh, area of concern for Poji was the quarterback position. Uh, seemingly, Max Brown, uh, the hand-picked starting quarterback for the 49ers in 2024, according to Poji, the uh, Florida State, or excuse me, Florida, my apologies, Florida transfer, uh, who played six games for the Gators last season, including the start against Florida State. Um, uh, According to Poji, uh, quote, anybody who watched us last year knows that that was the Achilles heel of the team, talking about the quarterback position. We made it a priority to get a guy, and we got Max Brown. He is everything I hoped he was going to be and even more. Max is smart. He gets the concepts of the game and learns quickly and is a really good player. He has a live arm. He can run and is making the right reads. We're going to be able to do a lot of really cool stuff with him. He's growing leaps and bounds every day. The ball comes out fast, and if you do everything right on defense, he can put it in tight windows. Uh, so it sounds like in the first uh, days of spring practice, the first day in full pads, Brown was the first team quarterback. Uh, the uh, most experienced return Trexler Ivy was with the second team, and true freshman Desan Purdy was working with the threes, according to Bailey. Bill Wagner of the Capital Gazette uh, gave a follow-up at Navy about implementing the uh, sort of hybrid wing T offense that we discussed early on in, in Good Morning College Football. Uh, Wagner was, you know, there was a podcast episode where uh, he interviewed uh, new offensive coordinator Drew Cronick. Kronich, uh, who is uh, you know coming from Mercer, where he was the head coach at the FCS level, who described this as quote the millennial version of the wing T offense, um, and a couple of uh, interesting observations for me from. Head coach Brian Newberry said, quote, I look at everything from a defensive perspective, and I think that what we're doing, talking about the offense, uh, is challenging. We have to be unique and different here. This offense certainly provides that because it's non-traditional. Uh, so this is the second straight straight spring where Navy is implementing a new offense, but the defense has been in place under Newberry since he was hired as defensive coordinator in 2019. So again, not surprising. It's a place where the defense uh, seemingly is ahead of the offense so far this spring. Quoting here from Chronic, he says, uh, they've had this system in place for five years and done a great job defensively. So it's very challenging, which is good for us offensively. I was giving Coach Volker a hard time, the defensive coordinator, CJ Volker, uh, a hard time because on our first day in pads, they were lined up in a bunch of different stuff and we were doing a lot of things. They're going to move around and slant and bring guys off the edge. We've got to be able to adapt to, adapt to all that. I've already heard some of the defensive guys say this wing tee is hard to defend because there are so many elements and so much moving around. That's according to quarterbacks coach Ivan Jasper. I've been really encouraged. Newberry here. Sorry. Switching between uh, coaches and, and their quotes. This is Newberry again. I've been really, really encouraged. There have been some big plays made. Usually it's tough sledding for the offense in the spring. When you look at the tape, there's a misstep here or a blown assignment here from being a lot more big plays uh, that hit. I really like what we're doing, and I really like how we're doing it even more. We're going out there, flying around, and competing. So uh, something to, to perhaps keep an eye on, maybe one of the most unique offenses in college football, it sounds like, at Navy this year. All right, a few quick uh, things to, to finish up at New Mexico. Sean Ryder of the Albuquerque Journal uh, was on hand for the start of spring practice, according to new head coach Bronco Mendenhall, uh, who is saying post-practice, everybody's undefeated at this point. History of programs, history of teams doesn't matter. Each team and each staff gets to redefine what their goals are and what their expectations are and what their future is. And, and sort of that mindset, it sounds like, in a different piece from uh, readers uh, played a big role in, in why some New Mexico players seemingly after entering the transfer portal early in the, the cycle 
opted to to come back. It sounds like with conversations with Mendenhall, um, he you know talked about leaving a legacy. That was something that safety Tavian Combs uh, referred to as why he opted to to come back. Uh, safety Christian Ellis uh, said, "quote It was like I'd be foolish not to be part of that." You know, uh, he wins. So it's like, man, that's what I like to do. I like to win, and I'm a leader. Uh, also uh, talking about uh, defensive coordinator Nick Howell says uh, uh, it feels like we're all on the same page and I feel like I really fit in here. And then uh, running back. Uh, oh, gosh, uh, this is my my usual uh, missing a, a first name, but uh, New Mexico uh, running back Andrew, Andrew Henry, uh, also was quoted in the piece saying, um that uh, 16 out of 17 times coach has been in a bowl game. I want to win. I'm a super senior. So my goal is to play football and win. I want to have a career. I'm going to have a career after that. And the best chance of doing that is being somewhere where I can win. It's hard. Henry said of Ben and Hall's program. And that's the only way you can be good. And I want to be good. And I want to be part of a good team. And I don't want to go nowhere where it's nonchalant. And we just do what we want to do. I wanted someone with discipline and standards. And that's why me coming back and staying here is the best thing I could do. So New Mexico is a team that that really interests me. It's a difficult place to win. We've seen that, you know, there haven't been uh, very many victories, comparatively speaking, uh, you know, for the Lobos the, the last few uh, seasons. Bronco Mendenhall, as Henry said, is a, a coach who's <laughs> have a proven track record. Uh, 16 bowl games in 17 years, a lot of winning seasons, has uh, turned programs around, you know, Virginia uh, most recently, of course. Um, and to see how he's going to be able to sort of flip uh, the script in uh, a place like New Mexico, where it's been so difficult to win and, and win consistently. Um, I don't know. That that always really, really interests me. So are they going to be able to do it right away? Sounds like Mendenhall did a pretty good job of re-recruiting some of the roster um, and, uh, you know, keeping <laughs> some of the players that could help with that transition. Some of those players were uh, convinced that, yes, he can uh, make them more competitive and, and be a winning program sooner rather than later. Will it work out? Not so sure. Uh, but as far as, you know, the early days of spring practice goes, it sounds like uh, Devin Dampier is the leader in the quarterback composition competition, getting uh, those first team reps early. Justin Holiday, who started three games in 2022, has been uh, taking almost all of the second team reps. That's according to Reader. Uh, and at the running back pecking order, Henry right now uh, getting the most first team reps. Uh, but there is uh, quite a bit of competition coming in with a couple of transfers uh, getting uh, plenty of reps as well. Eli Sanders of Iowa State and Javen Jacobs, who has also spent some time at receiver when he was at Arizona State previously. Uh, those two are, are uh, getting uh, reps behind Henry and and are his top uh, competition, it seems. All right, so that will do it uh, for the news portion of this, but do want to spend a few times talking about UMass as our team of the day. And had we had this discussion on Wednesday, probably would have been a, a little bit of a, a different uh, tone to it because UMass is a team that um, uh, seemed like they – Took a little bit of a step forward last year, right? Three and nine, not going to impress too many people. But uh, after, <laughs> you know, one and 11 the previous year, prior to that, one and 11 with losses to FCS teams, um, uh, UMass, again, one of those places where it's really, really difficult to uh, win. But early in the offseason, picked uh, up some positive news with the uh, decision to join the MAC, being able to, to come in as a, a full MAC member. Uh, and this year, as we mentioned when uh, that news came out, they're playing kind of a, a pseudo MAC schedule, especially early in the year, opening with Eastern Michigan at home, then trips to Toledo and Buffalo. They get an FCS opponent, Central Connecticut, in week four, but for back-to-back road games at Miami of Ohio and then at Northern Illinois. So, uh, you know, five MAC opponents in the first 
six weeks. Um, and a lot of those games, even though UMass hasn't won very much or, or very consistently, um, uh, seem winnable. There's another FCS opponent on the schedule in late October. That's Wagner. Very, very winnable game there. Uh, consistently one of the uh, lower performing FCS teams. Um, so, you know, UMass uh, seems like uh, maybe, you know, prior to the second half of the season uh, where they're playing a, a much, much uh, more proven uh, set of opponents. They do have a home game against Missouri, oddly enough, in uh, mid-October. Uh, they take a trip to Starkville to play Mississippi State. They host Liberty, who they've played uh, quite a bit over the last few years. Both were independents uh, for a, a while there. Um, but Liberty, of course, undefeated in the regular season last year and, and a New Year's Six Bowl uh, team. Uh, and then in late November, they go to Georgia to play probably the preseason number one Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, they do finish with UConn at home. They're, uh, you know, regional rival there. Uh, so do perhaps have a, an opportunity to to finish on a high note after what you would expect, maybe some lopsided uh, results in uh, mid to late October and, and, and the month of November. But, you know, this UMass team had uh, Cameron Lynch Adams been back as expected you could say, all right, they, they're able to lean on that running game, you know, able to, to lean on him. He had uh, either entered or, or flirted with the portal in the early uh, window, but then, you know, opted to come back. The offensive line, there's a little bit of a transition. Two full-time starters are back, Josh Atwood and Ethan Mottinger, but uh, incoming transfers, including a couple of you know, highly rated recruits. Paul Shio was, uh, what, a a five star, some places I believe. Uh, Brendan Rome also coming in. Uh, so you know, talented guys, maybe not as experienced, but uh, the way that that we calculate things again, those individual player ratings and and how they you know roll up to unit ratings and and then those overall uh, roster strength ratings, team strength ratings. Uh, UMass was seemingly moving in the right direction on the offensive line. Uh, Mayo Glenn uh, coming in from Cincinnati to Chio, most recently at Georgia Tech. Um, and Rome was at Cal, where he's you know been a double digit starter. So uh, that offensive line with Lynch Adams getting the the bulk of the running back carries, you know, seemed like they were going to be able to keep uh, the the chains moving, uh, perhaps slow the game down if that was the intention. Don Brown, head coach, defensive-minded head coach, even though he's incredibly, incredibly ag aggressive uh, on defense, uh, still that seemed like a recipe potentially to keep games close. You know, when you've got opponents uh, like that, uh, certainly the the you know FCS opponents, maybe they'd be able to uh, you know uh, control those games and 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 uh, really maybe dominate the line of scrimmage somewhat. Uh, but the the games where you've got comparable talent to an Eastern Michigan or a Buffalo uh, or even Miami of Ohio, Northern Illinois, teams that have won the MAC, you know, in the not too distant past, uh, Miami of Ohio last year, uh, they're still not going to be just completely outmanned physically, UMass. Um, but now your best playmaker uh, is moving on. And, and so where do you go from there? There is some experience. Greg DeRozier's is, uh, the backup running back and somebody who, uh, earlier this week, Don Brown, uh, was very complimentary of in a, uh, piece written by Garrett Cole of the Greenfield recorder. Um, uh, when Brown said, you know, talking about Lynch Adams, great kid, works hard, and he has talent, he's rushed for over a thousand yards last year. And the other guy, DeRozier's, he's going to have a huge year. It's nice when you've got two of them. Uh, now, just the one. But uh, he also says he thinks that the wide receiver group is going to be surprisingly good. Doesn't want to put too much pressure on them. But Anthony Simpson, somebody who flashed at times last year, and let's not forget, this UMass team came out strong, beat. New Mexico State, a team that uh, ended up winning 10 games, playing Liberty for the Conference USA title. And this UMass team looked way better in, in uh, was that week zero, week one? Uh, week zero, I think. But uh, Anthony Simpson, somebody who came out, uh, had a great start to the season, was targeted nearly 100 times at 57 catches, 792 yards, and three touchdowns. Uh, they also added 
uh, Kishan Brown, tight end Dominic Mazzotti from San Jose State, where he was a pretty productive pass catcher, had 23 catches, 322 yards, and two touchdowns last year. They added Sterling Galvin from Jacksonville State at the wide receiver group, Jacoby James as well. So uh, DeRozier, who was also a, a receiver when he started his career, at Louisville, um, is a pretty good pass catcher out of the backfield as well. 15 catches, 185 yards, and two touchdowns. Behind Samson is actually the top returner uh, uh, among you know those receiving statistics at, at UMass last year. But uh, Tyson Pomachon, the starting quarterback, uh, unfortunately is going to be limited this spring. According to Brown, quote, we're bringing him along real slow and being smart. I'm not a doctor. I just do what the trainers tell me to do. Obviously, we're taking all the precautions necessary to make sure that we get a healthy Pumachan come the fall. Uh, sounds like Ahmad Haston, who did play three games last year for UMass Pumachan, was, as has been unfortunately the case for him the last few years, impacted by injury, limited at times. So Haston was able to come in, uh, and sounds like he's going to get a, a little bit of an extended uh, opportunity this season with Pumachan sidelined, who uh, is uh, going to be out. It sounds like uh, uh, he missed time last year with a knee injury, returned at the end of the year, but had a small surgery to clean up the damage, according to Cote. Um, and the plan for the spring is to keep him sidelined as a precautionary measure while he works on rehabbing and strengthening his leg. Pomachan and just sort of his ability to solidify the quarterback position, in my opinion, was part of the, the big reason why uh, UMass looked as good as it did in that opening game. Uh, and when he wasn't available or fully healthy, you know, they're, they're a different team. Uh, so getting him back, letting him rest all spring, maybe not the perfect scenario as far as chemistry with wide receivers and, and uh, perhaps, you know, a, a top uh, ball carrier now uh, in, in the mix. But getting him back and healthy is going to be uh, a big piece of the puzzle for UMass if they are going to, you know, take a, a step forward. This is a team that uh, really struggled defensively last year, despite Don Brown's defensive uh, background and, and that level of aggression. They ranked 132nd in our defensive team performance numbers. Uh, they also have a new offensive coordinator because Steve Kasula is uh, now Colson Loveland's position uh, coach at Michigan. Uh, so uh, still some moving pieces, but the upgrades, at least in, you know, at least on paper and some, some talent numbers on the offensive line, uh, there's still, I think, some hope that this UMass team is going to be able to, uh, you know, carry on and, and not see a, a huge drop off offensively, even though they now have to uh, replace their most impactful uh, offensive player in, in Karon uh, uh, Lynch Adams. So um, UMass ranks 105th in our overall returning production rankings right now, 101st on the offensive side of the ball after the uh, Lynch Adams news, 104th on the defensive side. They do return leading tackler uh, Tyree Powell, number three tackler Gerald Johnson, and uh, safety Tyler Rudolph ranked fifth in tackles last season. Uh, there's there's definitely a hit to uh, the defensive line. That's going to be a major area uh, of focus, but UMass has uh, brought in multiple pl players at every position group, um, really across the roster, but uh, on the defensive side of the ball, uh, perhaps most importantly, through the transfer portal, including about a half a dozen uh, players in the secondary. So um, this, this team's going to have to get up to speed quickly, uh, take advantage of that, you know, more manageable first half of the schedule, five MAC opponents, two FCS opponents uh, in the first two months of the season. Gets much, much tougher in November. Uh, but then that game against UConn is, is you know, always competitive and and uh you'd expect a, a winnable game so will this umass team be able to take a step forward in the one you know in in the win column i think it's definitely possible uh, you know uh, three wins should be uh the floor beat both fcs opponents 
beat somebody else. Uh, and then, you know, you get some things to, uh, to, to click offensively, uh, which now is a little bit more of a question mark than it was 24 hours ago. But um, this UMass team, I think, is, is going to be playing uh, some competitive games in September uh, and early October as well. So uh, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on where Lynch Adams ends up. Will it be a power five team? Will it be a little bit more CFF friendly opportunity perhaps, but that's going to do it for today and this week on good morning college football uh, episode 29. I'm Nicholas Ian Allen of CFP winning edge and campus Tanton.com. Thank you so much for your support at the site uh, with our members. We very, very much appreciate that, but we also uh, are very thankful for those of you who support us with a like on this video, by subscription, uh, sub by subscribing to the Campus Canton YouTube channel, or just by viewing. You know, by by joining us live or, or catching uh, a uh, uh, later edition of this on YouTube. We we very very much appreciate it. We'll be back on Monday for episode thirty of uh, Good Morning College Football. Hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Take care.